All right. Uh, so we're going to talk about testing for TB infection, TST versus the IGRA. <clears throat> and again, uh, as the TB medical consultant for the Pennsylvania Department of Health, this probably generates the most calls and emails I get on how to interpret uh, the IGRAs and the TSTs. So I'm going to give a lot of background and then going to give some case studies and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So I'm happy to answer any questions <clears throat> as we go along. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I have nothing to disclose. The only thing I will disclose is that I did take this picture of this uh, beautiful child and her mother uh, when I was in Guatemala a couple of years ago. So I will claim that. Other than that, I have nothing else to claim. <clears throat> well, this was what a TB clinician looked like in Pennsylvania in the 1920s. And I think we'd all agree that I don't look like that now in my TB clinics. And I doubt that any of you folks, the doctor and nurse there, look like that now. <clears throat> but the only thing that is the same as it was in the 1920s is that we're still doing TSTs, tuberculin skin test. Tuberculin skin tests were actually uh, begun in 1907. So this physician and this nurse were very adept at putting on PPDs. Uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and I think we'd all agree that that's uh, been over 100 years now. So uh, <clears throat> everything else has changed, including look at that cell phone right by that kid's head. Um, I think we're all using different phones than that now. So first, I want to give a little background just to put this in perspective of why we need to test people who are infected or potentially infected with TB disease, uh, TB infection. Um, Every year, including in 2021, and these are the last uh, statistics that the WHO has globally, there were 10.6 million cases of active tuberculosis. About 12% of those, 1.2 million, were co-infected with HIV, and about 558,000 were reported as multiple drug-resistant TB. And we know that multiple drug-resistant TB, these are probably fewer than a 25% of those who were thought, thought to have MDR-TB in the world because <clears throat> many places in the world do not do drug sensitivities. There were 1.6 million deaths in 2021 from tuberculosis, which was an increase from the year before, probably related to COVID, uh, a lot of resources going to COVID. And that 1.6 million means that every day, 4,400 people are dying globally from tuberculosis. This is a curable, treatable disease, but we still have 4,400 people who died yesterday, who will die today, and who will die tomorrow of a curable, treatable disease. That's why we need to test people for TB infection and give them preventive treatment so they don't get active TB and don't die from TB. And this is what we see, oh, sorry. Whoops, going the wrong direction. This is what we see um, in the United States. You'll notice that we had a big peak. Uh, we were running about 25,000 cases a year. It went up to almost 30,000 cases in the mid 90s due to the HIV pandemic and also due to MDR pandemic and the fact that uh, public health funding had really decreased. But then we've had a nice steady decline since that time. We had a big dip uh, during COVID, uh, but then it came, it rebounded back up right after COVID and we're back to almost where we were pre-COVID. Um, you'll also notice the blue line, the blue bar is um, non-U.S. born. The pinkish bar is U.S. born. And back in the early 90s, about 70% of all cases were U.S. born. Only about 30% were uh, born outside the United States. That's been totally reversed now. And now about 75% or so are born outside the United States and only about 25% are 
of active TB cases in the United States are in people who were born in the United States. And so that now we have a pocket of individuals that are much higher risk of being infected with TB. So we can focus on those individuals at highest risk for our testing. And so it's very important to know who we're going to test uh, because we want to make sure we're hit, hitting that high risk group. Well, I think it's also important to know uh, what the other hidden um, information is about uh, TB. We talked about those active cases. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble advancing my slides for some reason. There we go. So there were about a little under 8,000 active cases back in 2021. But that's just that's just the hidden the hidden part of this is that we then do a contact investigation on all those almost 8,000 cases. We identify an average of about 18 contacts of each active case. Of those, about 1% of the time, we find a new active case when we're doing that contact investigation. And about 20% of the people during that contact investigation will be found to have TB infection. So it's estimated that we then have to evaluate about 141,000 individuals, test them and offer preventive treatment if they are infected. So that 8,000 cases really doesn't show the load that we have in health departments in following up this investigation. We now, it's estimated now in the United States that we have about over 13 million individuals who are infected uh, with TB. And those individuals have about a 10% risk of going on to active disease in their lifetime if they have a normal immune system. If their immune system is not normal, that risk is higher than 10%. And about 5% of that risk is in the first two years after you're infected. And that's important to know. The first two years after you're infected, you have a 5% risk of going on to active disease. So those are very high risk individuals that we wanna make sure that we're testing. And if they're positive, we're offering preventive treatment to them so that they don't go on to active disease. So what are those things that will cause someone who is infected to be at higher risk of going on to active disease? Well, first of all, HIV. HIV, if you have uncontrolled HIV, your risk is not 10% in your lifetime. With untreated, uncontrolled HIV, your risk is seven to 10% per year of going on to active disease. So obviously anyone who is co-infected with HIV, especially if they're not on antiretrovirals, they're at very high risk in that first year of going on to active disease. So they would be someone who we'd wanna make sure we test and treat for active, um, for TB infection. As I mentioned, if you have a recent infection, you have a 5% risk over the next two years of going on to active disease. If you have an abnormal chest X-ray, suggestive of possibly previous TB, you're at higher risk. Diabetes now has become worldwide, and especially in the United States, a significant risk factor for activating TB if you're TB infected. It's felt that it's probably two to three times greater risk if you have uncontrolled diabetes of going on to active disease from TB infection. If you're on prolonged corticosteroid therapy so that your immune system is blunted, then you have a higher risk of going on to active disease. Obviously, if you're on any other immunosuppressive therapy like chemotherapy for cancer or one of the newer uh, biologicals for arthritis or psoriasis, you know, we hear that on, on TV all the time uh, to be tested for TB because you're at higher risk for going on to active disease if you're on those new drugs. If you have a history of inadequately treated TB in the past, or if you're a child under five, especially children under two, a child under two uh, 
does not have a 10% lifetime risk of going on to active disease. That child has a 40 to 50% chance, if infected, of going on to active disease within the next year or so. And so they are very high risk. And when they do go on to active disease, it is not uncommon for them to, to present with TB meningitis, which can be devastating. So that's why we do window prophylaxis on children. We put them on TB uh, infection uh, preventive treatment uh, while we're waiting for them to possibly convert a, a TB skin test or an IGRA. So children under five are at very high risk of going on to active disease. And I put this slide up just because this is one of the reasons why I love TB Clinic, because we're dealing with individuals who are from all over the world. They all have a very interesting story of how they got to the United States and what they have done in their own countries. Um, and so these are the individuals that are at the highest risk for TB. And just as a little anecdote, that, that big mass in that woman's neck is not a goiter. What that is, is burned out old calcified TB lymph nodes. Um, we had to rule out active disease in her. Uh, we actually did a, a biopsy of that mass that showed old burned out granulomas uh, before we could treat her uh, as a TB infection. So now we're gonna talk about what I'm here to talk about, actual testing for TB infection. Well, first of all, who does not need to be, who is not currently being tested for TB before they enter the United States? Student visa holders are not required to be TB tested, although many colleges and, and schools are now requiring that themselves, but it's not required by the US government for a student who has a visa uh, to be, be a student in the United States to have a TB skin test. If you're a temporary work visa holder, you do not have to be tested for TB. All those millions of tourists who come in every day are not tested for TB. And many of those tourists overstay their visas and are remaining in the uh, United States undocumented and they were not required to be tested for TB. Diplomats are not required to be tested for TB. And obviously any undocumented individuals who came into the United States um, uh, were not tested for TB. Who also now no longer needs to be yearly tested for TB. Healthcare workers. This came out in MMWR in, two, in May of 2019. It was the tuberculosis screening, testing, and treatment of U.S. healthcare personnel. This was the recommendations from uh, NTCA and the CDC. And it stated that in the absence of known exposure or evidence of ongoing TB transmission, U.S. healthcare personnel without TB infection should not undergo routine serial TB screening or testing at any interval after their baseline. So now annual testing for all the nurses and doctors who are working in hospitals are no longer needed to be tested on an annual basis. Now, the caveat to this is, unless they're doing high-risk procedures like bronchoscopies or working in a TB clinic, like I still get tested every year because I work in a TB clinic. And so are all the nurses who work with me. Okay, there are now three tests that we have in the United States. Two IGRAs, interferon gamma release assays. IGRAs are the quantiferon TB gold in tube and the T-spot. Those are the two FDA approved IGRAs that we have in the United States. And we still have the tuberculin skin test, the TST or PPD uh, purified protein derivative, uh, TB skin test uh, is the other test that we have. These are the only three tests that we have in the United States for testing for TB infection or TB disease. They can be used for both 
testing for TB infection and TB disease. And I'm going to give you some statistics now. And, and I think it's really important when we're talking about testing, it's very, very important to look at the numbers, the actual numbers, and interpret them based on the patient in front of you. So you always have to be aware of statistics and data. And I put this very young Ed Zerwesti. I used to have a dark beard and dark hair, and now it's all white. Um, but this was a sign, an actual sign out of, outside of Gold Hill, Colorado. And it said it was established in 1859. Elevation was 8,463 feet. The population of Gold Hill is 118 total. 10,440. So that's data, that's statistics, but it's not good data. So what I'm going to give you in good data, and I want you to make sure that you're interpreting the data you get. These are just tests, so you have to interpret them um, in relationship to the person in front of you. So let's talk about first the old standby, the TST, the MAN2 test, the PPD, Again, it was created in 1907. So now we're up to what, 115 years. It's time to put this, this old guy to bed. It's time to, to bury this TST. We're not quite there yet. It still has some utility, but it should not be used at any frequency like it did before. We should really be relying now on the IGRAS. As you all know, it's an intradermal injection of tuberculin material, so it's very difficult to do. You have to do it intradermally, right under the dermis, uh, not subdural, uh, not subdermal, and it, it acts as stimulating a delayed type hypersensitivity response mediated by T lymphocytes that are not specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis, but specific for the mycobacterium. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. In patients with prior mycobacterium exposure, it causes induration at the injection site within 48 to 72 hours. So you place it, which is difficult. Then the person has to come back in 48 to 72 hours to read it, which is difficult. So when you read it and you're just reading the induration, the swelling, not the redness, if it's greater than or equal to five millimeters, it's considered positive in any HIV patient, irregardless of the CD4 count. It's considered positive if you're a close contact to an active contagious case. It's considered positive if you have an abnormal chest X-ray or if you're on any of the immunosuppressives like TN-alpha inhibitors, chemotherapy, if you're on an organ transplantation, uh, if you're on glucocortico treatment equivalent to greater than 15 milligrams a day of prednisone for over a month, then five millimeters is considered positive. It's considered positive if it's over 10 millimeters, if you have certain conditions that increase your risk for reactivation, like silicosis or malignancies, as I said, uncontrolled diabetes, malnutrition, if you're an IV drug user, if you're a resident or employee of a high-risk setting like prisons or jails or healthcare facilities, if you work in a mycobacterium lab, if you're in a homeless shelter, or if you're a child under four, and the biggest category, if you were born outside the United States in a high-incidence country. In particular, we used to say if you've immigrated in the past five years, but really we're not looking at that as much as we did in the past because many people who are positive uh, immigrated well over five years ago. And we shouldn't even be testing these people. If you're a healthy individual over age of four and you have a greater than 15, then it's considered uh, positive. I wanna talk a little bit about boosters and conversion. Uh, we all know that if you're a brand new nursing student, we do a two-step PPD. That's where if you have a, uh, a negative PPD, then one to four weeks later, we put a second PPD on. And if that one is positive, in the absence of TB exposure, it sometimes means that somebody uh, had a, a TB 
ex in infection years and years and years ago, and it's to wake up the immune system. That second PPD gives a booster to your immune system, and the second PPD may be positive uh, because your immune system had forgotten. So it may be, as I mentioned, a sign of remote TB infection. And it's really important to do a two-step the first time so that we avoid misclassifying someone as a new conversion. An actual conversion is someone who has an increase of at least 10 millimeters in their PPD since their previous testing in a study of an ongoing risk. <clears throat> Remember that just putting on PPDs every year will not lead to a false positive PPD. <clears throat> This is one of the, the major problems with um, uh, the TB skin test, and that is they have to come back. The person has to come back in 48 to 72 hours, and people are really bad about coming back. Return rates vary from 18 to 72 percent, depending on the population, and this is really important in high-risk groups. So, for example, a study showed HIV-positive people, only 57 percent actually even came back to have their PPD read. Immigration employees, these are people who work in immigration, only 39% of them came back. And in one study in pediatrics, less than 50% came back. Obviously, failure to come back for the result reading undermines the TST. So that's a huge barrier to this test. If, if half or, or less are coming back, to be read, then you've already lost a, a huge number of people that are at high risk. <clears throat> so what can make a PPD falsely positive? Well, non-TB uh, mycobacterium. As I mentioned, this is not specific for tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It can be positive for any of the mycobacterium. And we now know that there are approximately over 200 non-tuberculin mycobacterium species out there. So any of those that a person has been exposed to might give you a false positive PPD. If you've had a BCG vaccine, remember that BCG is made up of mycobacterium bovis, and it definitely can give you a positive PPD. It's more likely if a person received a booster of their BCG. Most people that get BCGs, and this is given all over the world, get it on day one after they're born. Uh, the first day after they're born, they get a BCG, and it works very well in preventing neonatal TB meningitis, but it doesn't prevent a person from getting infected with TB. It does, however, cause a false positive PPD. It does wane over time, but a 12 millimeter PPD in an eight-year-old versus a 12 millimeter PPD in a 60-year-old is a big difference. By 60 years old, you should not be having a reaction to your PPD. You can always look for a scar on the upper lateral arm. It looks like an old um, a scar that we used to get uh, from smallpox. Um, so if you see a scar, then that person probably had a BCG as an infant. Another thing about falsely positives are that you should always read a PPD horizontally across the forearm. Reading is, you know, a lot of people close their eyes and feel the induration. Some people use a pen and then you have to measure. And as I said, you know, a, a four millimeter is negative, a five millimeter might be positive, a nine millimeter is negative, a 10 millimeter may be positive. We all know the difference between one millimeter is very tiny, especially if you're measuring in duration. Um, so it, it's very difficult to read. So a lot of false positives may be in a false reading of a positive. How about false negatives? If you're immunosuppressed, if you have HIV with a very low CD4 count, if you're on steroids, if you have malignancy, if you're on a TN-alpha inhibitor, if you're malnourished, if you have chronic renal insufficiency, your immune system will not respond, even if you've been infected with TB, so that that can give you a false negative PPD and a false negative IGRA. Any active infection, including active TB, it is not uncommon to have a falsely negative PPD and a false negative IGRA, even 
with active tuberculosis. If you have any other recent infection, if you're a close contact for an active case, it may take eight to 12 weeks for an immune system to mount a response and make your uh, PPD positive. If you've had recent live vaccines like an MMR, you might have a false positive PPD. If you've had improper storage or improper administration, improper reading, all those things can give you a false negative PPD. So a lot of things can give you false negatives and false positive PPDs. This is not a perfect test. It's a very, very difficult test. And that's why we need to move on to the IGRIS. The interferon, IGRIS stands for interferon gamma release assays, IGRA, I-G-R-A. As I said, there are two of them, the quantiferon gold in tube plus and the T-spot. They're blood test. They measure the T-cell release of interferon gamma following stimulation by antigens that are more specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis, not the other 200 mycobacterium. There's the quantiferon gold plus. It's an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, so it's an ELISA, and the T-spot is an enzyme-linked immunospot, an L-spot assay. So there are many advantages over the PPD. It does not cross-react to prior BCG vaccine. So you should always do an IGRA, not a PPD, on someone who had a BCG to avoid that potential false positive. It also does not cross-react with most other non-tuberculin mycobacterium. It's a one-stop shop. Once you draw the blood, you're going to get the test. So the person does not need to come back. So you avoid all those people who were not going to come back the second time. It's much more automated, so it has less room for error. You're not having a very difficult placing of the PPD. You're not having the very difficult reading. It's an automated reading. And it has built-in measure of immune function. The main disadvantage over the PPD is it's not been well studied in children under two, but now most pediatric TB experts are testing all children, at least down to age one. So it's becoming less of a disadvantage, even in the pediatric population. So we're going to first talk about quantiferon gold. And as I mentioned, I, I gave this talk in front of a live audience of, of fairly seasoned TB clinicians and nurses. And I asked them, when you get a quantiferon gold test back, do you just get positive or negative, or do you get the four numbers? And about half the people in that audience said they only get a positive test. So I'm asking you now, and you don't have to put this in the chat, but just all, all of you on the line, how many of you are interpreting at a quantiferon gold IGRA test on just a positive or negative result and not looking at the numbers. And if you're not looking at the numbers, you're missing a lot of false positives or false negatives. And I'll explain to you why. You should always know these four numbers. There's a number, there's four tubes that are drawn. The first tube is the mitogen, which is the positive control. That should always be very positive. If you get a low response, it may indicate that you have an inability to generate your interferon gamma uh, in your body. The nil is the negative control. So it adjusts for any background uh, interferon uh, gamma. And then you have two tests, a TB1 which primarily detects the CD4 T cell response to tuberculosis, and the TB2, which optimizes for the detection of both CD4 and CD8 TB cell responses. So you have two tubes to evaluate 
whether it's TB, the person is TB infected or not. So now we're using both CD4 and CD8 cells. So the results are in international units per milliliter. A positive result is when you have a positive mitogen, your positive control, you have a negative nil, which is your negative control, and then you have a positive result in either tube one or tube two. And a positive result in tube one or tube two is minus the nil if it's greater than 0 0.35 international units per milliliter. So memorize that number. You have to have greater than 0 0.35 in either tube one, tube one or tube two. A negative result is when you have a positive mitogen, your positive control is positive, You're, you have a negative nil, your negative control is negative, and when you have a negative result in both tube one and tube two, that's a negative result. An indeterminate result is if you have a negative mitogen, your positive control is negative. So you're immunosuppressed for some reason, so much so that it doesn't give you a good test. If you have a positive nil, if your if your control negative is positive, then there's high background noise. Or if you had improper te testing technique, you didn't draw enough blood, you shook the tube too much. So an indeterminate result is not a result. It's not um, borderline. It's not, <laughs> it's indeterminate. So you have to throw that test out. It doesn't count for anything. You have to repeat the test always. And remember, no test is perfect. False negatives, you might get a false negative if you're in that window between when somebody was infected and they are able to build an immune response. It could take up to eight to 12 weeks. So you should retest that person. And you can have a false positive if you have M. bovis, not BCG, but actual the infection with Mycobacterium bovis will give you a false positive. M. kansasi, sergosi, and marinum can give you a false positive. And low risk patients with a low TB1 or low TB2, and this is very common in my experience, probably six to eight percent of low risk patients will have a false positive IGRA um, in their TB1, TB2. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So here is a true positive test. You, you notice up here. It says positive, right? But if that's all you're getting, you're not getting these numbers. Your TB1 is 1.77, way above the 0.35 minimal. Your TB2 is 1.79, again, way above the 0.35. I almost always see above one for any true positive test. Anything below one is a little bit suspect to me. So we'll talk about that. Your nil, your uh, control negative is very low, 0 0.08. And your mitogen, your control positive is greater than 10, very positive. So this is a true positive, undeniable positive quantifying gold. Now let's look at another one. <clears throat> look at this one. The TB1 is 0.39, not much above the 0.35. The TB2 is 0.37, even less above 0.35. But it is a true positive with an exclamation point. If that's all you see and you don't look at this, and this is a low-risk person, this very possibly could be a false positive test. If you repeat it, these numbers could come back as zero. Very common false positive. How about the next one? Look at this one. 
And again, in that one before, you had a very good nil and a very good mitogen, as you do here. Nil, 0.04, mitogen greater than 10. But look at TB1, 0.47, above the 0.35. But look at TB2, 0.27, less than the 0.35. But remember, I told you, you just have to have one of them above 0.35 to consider it positive. This will come back to you as a positive. But again, depending on the person in front of you, if this is a very low risk individual with no risk factors at all, this very well may be a false positive IGRA. <clears throat> all right, here's two examples of indeterminate. They don't count. Lousy test. It doesn't count. This one over here, the 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 uh the tb1 and tb2 are 0.04 the mitogen is very low uh the nil is very low so these are indeterminate indeterminate you can't determine at anything at all so this test needs to be rep repeated <clears throat> okay now let's talk about the t-spot if you get T-spots, again, if you just get a, a positive and a negative and don't look at the numbers, you're going to be missing out. So how do you interpret the T-spot? It's totally different. You have, you have um, panels. And in those panels, there's a nil control, which should have none. And there's a... Uh, positive control, which has lots of spots. You have a positive test at panel A minus the nil and or panel B minus the nil is equal to or greater than eight spots. So again, if either panel is greater than eight, equal to or greater than eight spots, it's positive. It's negative if both panel A minus the nil and panel B minus the nil is equal to or less than four. So equal to greater than eight, positive, equal to less than four, negative, five, six, or seven, it's equivocal. So this one does have a borderline. <laughs> and a borderline, again, you have to interpret depending on the person in front of you. Uh, but it is not equivocal. It is actually a number. It's telling you that you're not positive, you're not negative, you're equivocal. It was a good test. It's just equivocal. Okay? Now, remember interpretation. Neither the PPD or the IGRAS differentiates between TB infection or active TB disease. That should be active TB disease. Neither is used to follow response to the treatment in a patient with active disease. These are going to remain positive even after you treat for TB infection or treat for TB disease. This is your immune system. As long as your immune system stays good, you'll have lifelong immunity, and these tests will always be positive. Both of these should remain positive for life. So, Let's now do a couple examples, okay? Let's talk about a couple of real cases. Here we have an eight-year-old girl, healthy girl from Brazil, a country that has a lot of TB. Her PPD is 10 millimeters, but her IGRA is negative. So what questions about this child history do you wanna ask? So if we were live, I'd have you just throw out a bunch of questions. So just think to yourself, what questions you want to know about this girl? Because it's important. History, history, history is so important. Did she receive a BC vaccine? And especially, did she get a booster? Some kids got boosters at five or six. If she had a booster, that PPD of 10 millimeters very may, well may be a false positive PPD based on her vaccine and her IGRA being negative is a true test. Is she a close contact of an active case? What if she told you 
that her grandmother was just diagnosed with active TB two weeks ago. All right, she's got a 10 millimeter PPD, a negative IGRA. Maybe it's too early for her to have uh, mounted a, a immune, uh, immune response and, it, and you need to test her in eight to 12 weeks. <clears throat> Who placed and read that initial PPD? Maybe it was read wrong. Maybe it was redness and not truly a positive, not really 10 millimeters. Is she immunocompromised in any way? Is she on steroids? Is she <clears throat> on chemotherapy for any reason? All these will help you determine what these two tests mean, all right? The test itself is useless without a good, and I'll say this once, I may say it many times, linguistically and culturally appropriate history. A linguistically and culturally appropriate history is the most valuable tool you have in your medical toolbox. And I would argue it's used way too infrequently at its maximum. That tool, the linguistic and culturally appropriate history is an extremely strong, important tool in your toolbox. Okay, now a 60 year old female from Brazil, uncontrolled diabetes, chronic in chronic renal insufficiency had a 10 millimeter PPE and also a negative IGRA. So what do we want to know about her? What do we want to know about this person? What historical questions? Again, the most important question always, are you a close contact of an active case? Never forget that question. Find out whether this person's been around somebody recently or any time for TB. Is she on immunosuppressive medications? Very possible if she's uh, got chronic renal insufficiency. She might be on a renal transplant list. Okay. All those questions are extremely important to know to interpret the test that you have before you. Okay. Now let's go back to the healthy girl again. And, and now she's got a 30 millimeter PPD and still a negative eye growth. Dr. Zareski, you're on mute. We can't hear you. I don't know why we can't hear you, but I think you might by accident leave place on mute. You are correct. Okay, how, <laughs> how long was I muted? Was I muted very long? No. Okay. The, the, the All right. so, so the same question. Thank you very much, Patty. Uh, you always have to look out for me, Patty. I'm a gray-haired old guy, and sometimes I make these pretty significant mistakes. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so again, history, history, history. All right. All right. Now let's go to a 30 year old patient from Haiti with HIV. This person had a PPD two years ago, which was zero and now presents to you today in your clinic and has a positive IGRA. So what historical question do you want to ask this individual? All right. Was she on antiretrovirals two years ago? Okay, two years ago, if she had HIV, maybe she didn't even know she had HIV, had a very low CD4 count. They put a PPD on zero millimeters because she had no immune system, right? No, she was not on antivirals. So that negative PPD very well could have been a false negative PPD and she was already TB infected. Is she a close contact of an active case? Very, very important question. No, she's not a close contact of an active case. Well, that's good. Um, 
I can't see my own question here. Oh, is she on antiretrovirals now? Yes. So now she's on antiretrovirals. Maybe your CD4 count is now good. You put a, I, you did a, drew an IGRA. It's positive now. That test you can take to the bank. If it's a true positive, then she probably is infected. And as we mentioned before, very high risk for going on to active disease. So you really want to know about this person and get her into treatment. Would you treat her as an LTBI? I just answered my own question. Absolutely yes. Capital, capital, yes. Very high risk going for active disease. All right, now you have a 40-year-old healthy male from Brazil, had a PPD of 10, IGRA negative. He works in a neonatal ICU. All this is very pertinent history. Works in a neonatal ICU. What historical questions do you want to ask this individual? Is this individual a close contact of an active case in the past? No. He gives no history of being around an active case. Is he on immunosuppressive medications that can make his IGRA negative? No, he is not. Has he had a previous PPD and was it positive or negative? These are all very pertinent historical questions. He says two years ago, his PPD was 10 millimeters. So now you have twice someone from a high-risk country with what would be considered a positive PPD, has a negative IGRA now. So would you treat him as TB infection? Would you offer treatment? And he works in a neonatal ICU. And if he becomes active TB, at work with pulmonary cavitary TB, coughing up tens of thousands, millions of red snappers every day, what would that do? You would want to treat this person because if he converts to active disease, it is a disaster, right? Clinically, you have to make decisions. Things are not black and white. Oftentimes, they're very gray. All right, now we have an 18-year-old. I see this all the time. U.S. born, healthy, no history of international travel, has never been out of Pennsylvania, or known exposure to TB. She's getting TB tested because it's required for entry to college. Her PPD is zero, zero millimeters. Her QFT, and it was placed by your TB nurse who knows what she's doing. Her Quantiferin Gold Plus, her TB1 was 0 0.35 international units. Her TB2 was 0 0.22 international units. And since all you do is get a positive QFT back, you don't look at your numbers, you right away treat her as an LTBI. But after this course, you're always going to look at the numbers and you're going to say to yourself, I have in front of me a very low risk person with a 0.35 barely positive and a 0.22. What am I going to do? What are you going to do next on this person? Are you going to get a chest x-ray? If that's normal, offer LTBI treatment. Is that what you're going to do? If all you got back was a positive QFT, I better, I, I best believe that's what you've already done. That's the wrong thing to do. Why expose this 18 year old to an x-ray she doesn't need? Are you going to obtain a, a PPD to verify the positive QFT? Maybe that PPD wasn't a two-step. Are you going to do the second one to make it a two-step to make sure you don't boost her or she wasn't infected when she was a tiny kid and her immune system isn't responding? Possibly. That could help if it's negative, but it's going to require her to come back again. Two visits, right? Is that what you're going to do? 
probably not the greatest choice. Are you going to repeat the QFT plus? You got a 0.35, you got a 0.22. That's the best answer. You have a greater than 90% chance this is going to, what's going to come back negative. You know, in Pennsylvania now, what we've done at our state lab is any QFT that comes back with a TB1 or TB2 less than 0.45, we repeat it on that same specimen. So it never comes back to me because the majority of times when, when either or both of these are less than 0.545, it comes back negative. Um, so numbers are extremely important. So what's the most important take home messages? And we got plenty of time for questions afterwards, okay? But here's the most important take home messages. When interpreting results of PPD or IGRA, always interpret um, these results in the context of the patient. Again, in the context of a linguistically, culturally appropriate history. Never interpret results of PPD or IGRAs without that information. There is no gold standard to diagnose latent TB infection, pretest probability matters. Ask yourself, what risk factors does this patient have for being infected with TB? What risk factors does this patient have for reactivation of latent TB infection if they are infected? What are the consequences of their TB reactivation? Like that guy who worked in the neonatal ICU, what are the consequences of TB reactivation? So what risk are you taking? What are the possible reasons for a false positive or a false negative PPD or IGRA? These are the take-home messages that I want you to take home, okay? These are the most important things to get out of this talk. So there's my contact information. Feel free to call me. That's my cell phone or email me at easerwesty at migraclinician.org. And right now we have time for questions. Patty, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Zerwesty, for that excellent talk. And we do have some questions. Let's see. And so let me stop sharing so that we can see everybody. How's that? So, okay, Patty, take it away. Right. The first question we have is um, just wanted to make sure you said frequent use of PPD over a lifetime doesn't cause increased occurrences of false positives. That is correct. The PPD itself does not cause false positives. Now, the only caveat to that is if you have allergic reaction to the PPD that causes a big red swelling and it's an allergic reaction, that could get worse, um, but it will not make a positive PPD by continuing to do PPDs. Thank you. Um, my next question would be, uh, why could an active infection of TB cause a false negative? Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. Whenever the body is fighting off an infection, their, 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 your immune system is in hyper gear, right? So that it may overwhelm these tests. So the test, the immunity that, and again, I'm not an immunologist. So this is a very family doctor centric answer to your question. It's not a scientific answer, but because of that immuno um, overload, these tests very well could be negative. And we see it all the time. I, I am always surprised and not really surprised, but I'm always impressed with a negative PPD and a negative IGRA. And you've got cavitary active fulminant tuberculosis, smear positive, culture positive, NAT positive, and those tests are negative. So that's why tests are only as good as the interpretation of the patient that's in front of you. Excellent point. Great question, though. Great question. I think it's really important, too, when you're looking at contacts coming in, 
you know, make sure you do those symptom assessments and all that of the contacts because you might get a negative on a contact that really might be one of another case in a house. Exactly, exactly, Patty. And and so, and especially in little children that may not be very symptomatic at all, but they may have just not been acting right. They may have not been gaining weight. They may not be eating well. Th those Those red flags are very, very important. Hey, um, why do you, why do we still have to test people who come from endemic countries with PPD and not just use the quantifier? Well, that's an excellent question. Why do we? We should not. We should never, and I'll emphasize it, we should never do put a PPD on someone who had a BCG. We have a better test for that now. The test is the IGRIS either a quantiferin gold in tube plus or a T-spot is way, way better than a PPD because the PPD can give you a false positive for many, many reasons. Uh, it, it's estimated that, and, and this study was done in San Francisco years and years and years ago where they went universally to doing IGRAs. And what they found was they had probably 15, 20, 25% fewer false, fewer positives in their individuals born outside the United States. 15, 20, 25% fewer positive IGRAs than they were getting with their PPDs, which means they were getting a lot of false positive PPDs. So IGRAs are the way to go. And it's been cost-effective now, too. It's been proven to be cost-effective. PPDs are not more cost-effective than IGRAs. That, that's BS. People that say that forget that. Half the, sometimes up to half the time, the people don't even show back up, right? And all the nursing time and all that goes in and the, and the waste of doing chest X-rays on false positive PPDs make the IGRAs institutionally cost-effective over PPDs. That's not a good excuse. Is BCG, is BCG still administered routinely in other countries? Yes, in almost all endemic TB countries, BCG is still given. So all through Central America, South America, Africa, um, Russia, Asia, uh, India, all those countries, except for the United States, Australia, Canada, Western Europe, almost every other country on the planet are still doing BCG, usually day one of birth. And then some countries are, are doing boosters later on, but almost every country is doing it. And it's been great for one thing. What it does is prevent neonatal TB meningitis. It's excellent. So it's saved millions of babies' lives from neonatal TB meningitis, but it does not prevent TB infection. It's not good for that. Excellent questions. Can you discuss the discordance of PPD in IAGRA a bit more? I had a 50-year-old patient from Cuba with a PPD of 22 mm's in duration and negative IGRA, it was not urethema. Okay, so a 50 year old had a 22 millimeter PPD, good measurement, and a negative IGRA. Yeah, again, these are, these discordance are really common and it drives us all crazy. Um, what you then need to do in this 50 year old, and, and they're from an endemic country, Patty, is that what it's, you said? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. They're an endemic country. So their chance at age 50 of being infected is very high. So for me, any test that is positive, again, does this person know of any contact at all? I mean, that's always, and really drill down. And sometimes it's interesting, you know, the nurses will ask these questions, right? And then I'll come in and I'll say, even when you were a little child, 
do you ever think of anything? And they said, you know what? After the nurse talked to me, I talked to my relatives and guess what? Uncle, Uncle Bernie had TB when I was five years old, right? And the nurses are throwing up their hands. You know, I asked them that question, right? And now the doctor asked him and now he's got this history that I didn't get. Well, it's because it jogs their memory. Sometimes it was the second or third time that you ask somebody something that they remember. So this person very well may remember uh, that they were exposed. So if they're exposed, for sure, I would treat them. Even if you don't get a good history of exposure, I would treat this person. I would offer treatment to this person. All right, we've got a few more. What's, um, what's better assessment and medical management for a pediatric close contact who was previously treated with LTBI and exposed again to another TB case? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, Very interesting and very tough. That's why in Pennsylvania, we have George McSherry, our pediatric <laughs> TB expert. George McSherry is literally one of the world's greatest pediatric TB experts. And so I bounce questions like that off George all the time. But I think what George would say is, we used to think that once you were infected, the chance of you and treated, that you'll, you're never going to get infected again. But now through good studies in gold miners in Africa, we now know because we do DNA testing of strains of TB, we've seen gold miners who got TB active TB, treated for that active TB, cured of that TB, then a couple of years later, come up with active TB again, and they say, oh, it was just a recurrence. Well, now they check the DNA on that second one, and it doesn't match the DNA of the first one. They got reinfected. So remember, the concept is, once you're infected, you've got a good immune system now. So that child you're talking about, got infected, built up an immune system, got treated, so they got cured of that first infection, hopefully, right? We cured them of that infection. Now they got re-exposed. When they got re-exposed, their antibody should have very quickly gotten rid of that infection so they did not get reinfected. But it's not 100%. So in a child, I think what George would say, if they had significant exposure the second time, that he probably would treat them again. I think that's what George would say. But I would ask that specifically of George. This is where I call in my friends or call Global TB, call GTBI on cases like this, I would call them to get another opinion. And because the worst thing is, the worst case scenario is the kid got infected again and now they show up uh, a year later with TB meningitis and you said, gee, I wish I would have treated them, right? Whereas treating them, the risk of retreating them is so low that it's probably worth that risk. Yeah. That's a long winded explanation, but sorry. No, that was good. That's good. Um, and in two weeks, we'll have Dr. Feha, who's going to speak um, as a pediatrician. So we can maybe ask that question again. She also worked closely with Dr. McSherry. So um, when we have the pediatric talk, that would be a good question that we can always um, circle back to. Yeah. Why don't you tag that one, tag that one, Patty, Definitely. and make sure that that's addressed because that's an excellent, excellent, excellent question. You get a gold star. Whoever asked that question gets a double gold star. <laughs> These are great questions. And let me see. Um, let's scroll down here. There's a lot more questions. So a couple more. Um, at around what age and circumstances, if at all, without a booster, do BCGs not affect the result of a PPD? I think. I think with their and um, you can type in if I'm wrong, but I think they're asking like, you know, young, we say young children might have a fos false positive because they got BCG. Is there an age, let's say like, oh, after five or after four? I think that's what they mean because I get yeah. that question a lot too. Yeah, not really. You know, we really don't know. It really depends on the individual, um, what what the BCG does, how how good a response. It's supposed to wane over time. We used to say ignore 
the fact that somebody had a BCG if you have a positive skin test. Um, we don't really say that anymore because um, we know that older people have sometimes a positive response. Um, so there really isn't, I, I wish I could give you a cutoff, but, the, but for, I, I don't think there is one. Um, yes, the slides will be available. I'll go over that. Um, do you see increased sensitivity to the solution over time? The PPD? I think that's what they mean. Um, Increase it. Okay. Uh, like uh, okay, just wanted. I'm sorry. I, there's a, a comment before that. Okay, it's from the same person. Just wanted to make sure you said frequent use of PPD over lifetime doesn't cause increased occurrence of false positive. Do you see an increased sensitivity to the solution over time? So I guess if you keep getting injected, would that give you? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I honestly don't know. You know, I I probably had in my lifetime 20, 30 plus PPDs, uh, and I never had, believe it or not, uh, I'm still IGRA and PPD negative after all these years. I think it's because I have this mask that I wear all the time that catches the red snappers before it gets in my nose um, and mouth. But anyway, um, so no, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think if you if you have a tendency towards that sort of thing, you'd probably have a little bit of reaction at some point in time. But if you've never had any reaction, you're probably never going to have a reaction. Um, what should you do if you get more than one indeterminate? Boy, then I'd really question, you know, sometimes, and, and that's happened actually. You know, when it really was happening, it was happening with COVID. People were really sick with COVID and we were starting to use some biologicals and some hospitals required um, IGRIS on their patients before they would give the biologicals. Um, and they were all coming back indeterminate. So I think if your body is overwhelmed, your immune system is really overwhelmed, that that will cause indeterminates. Uh, I, I think you really have to look at those cases and or you got a bad batch of IGRIS or whoever's drawing the IGRIS is not doing it properly. So I would look at technique I'd look at the the material that you've got and the patient to see if they have some really significant immune uh, compromise situation. Would you switch to a different IGRA? That's another thing you could do. You could do, if you're doing uh, quantiferin, switch to T-spot. That's an excellent idea, Patty. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm not sure. I don't think I see any um, additional questions. Um, Great questions. And uh, we have like about, about five more minutes. So if there's something there, another question that you have, and I think I, I think I captured them all, but if I didn't, or if you come up with one after we are done with this talk, please feel free to um, get in touch with us um, or, or email GTBI because we will answer them or we can try to answer them at the beginning of the next session. Our next session next week is going to be treating for LTBI with Dr. Laura Zabel, who is the uh, director of the Global TV Institute. And um, then the following week, we're going to have Dr. Fayot. And the schedules can be found at the GTBI website and also all the recordings for each session. The next week, this recording won't be available to July 12th. Um, but it's in the chat. And also, please don't forget in the chat to do the survey. It's really important for you to do the surveys because we don't know what your needs are or what you want to see in future talks if we don't get our surveys. So please take a few minutes to do that. So I do not see any more questions at this time, but Dr. Sorvesti, thank you so much for doing this and joining us today. Excellent. I know I have a better understanding now interpreting those numbers. Um, thanks a lot, Patty. Yeah, and, really and thanks, everybody. Really Keep doing what you're doing, everybody, and get the numbers. <laughs> yes, a positive yeah. is not always a positive. <laughs> a negative is not always a negative. And All everybody, right. keep cool. Have a great weekend, and we will see you next Friday. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.